The Fermi Paradox. Part 22. Oh, just one more thing. As you can probably imagine, researching, writing, recording, assembling, and editing this project, all two and a half hours of it, has taken a long time. And in that time, many things have happened. One of the reasons I love astronomy and planetary science so much is that they are rapidly evolving fields, and new and wonderful discoveries are made every day. Additionally, while putting this project together, I stumbled across a few facts that, while interesting, weren't directly relevant to the topic. So, I will use this final addendum to plug any remaining holes. Perhaps the most vexing piece of information I uncovered concerned one of the stars of this series, Michael H. Hart. There's a reason why I return to his paper in episode after episode. His argument has become so intimately tied to the Fermi Paradox that many assume that it is the Fermi Paradox. Some have even gone so far as to rename the Fermi Paradox the Fermi-Hart Paradox. We don't know for certain what formulation Fermi employed to answer his famous question. In absence of anything concrete from Fermi, we have used Hart to provide us with a solid scientific platform on which to rest the paradox. Unfortunately, Michael H. Hart holds some questionable beliefs. Specifically, he is a white separatist, that is, not a white supremacist, but one who believes white people need to preserve their purity by forming their own nation apart from any lesser races. While this doesn't invalidate the claims of his paper, it does provide some insight into why he may have written it. A man who believes in the superiority of the white race will face some fairly intense existential questions should mankind ever encounter a race technologically, culturally, or horror of horrors, biologically superior to it. Indeed, the idea of white racial superiority being clobbered by alien racial superiority was what spurred H.G. Wells to write The War of the Worlds, and yes, Wells did couch it in those terms. Let me be clear. I consider Hart's argument scientifically sound, and I do not believe that scientific arguments should be affected or undone by any opinions their formulator may hold. That Isaac Newton was, by all accounts, a fairly despicable man who worked furiously to undermine the careers and reputations of his rivals does not alter the scientific value of the Principia as a document. And, just as history has divorced Newton the man from Newton the scientist, it seems that Hart's formulation of the Fermi paradox has, over time, been subsumed by Fermi. Perhaps that's just as well. On a lighter note, the wow signal may soon be solved. Maybe. Antonio Paris, a professor of astronomy at St. Petersburg College, Florida, believes he may have tracked down the elusive origin of the hydrogen signal detected by the Ohio State's Big Ear Radio Telescope back in August 1977. Two recently discovered comets, Comet Christensen and Comet Gibbs, have orbit tracks that take them into Big Ear's field of view on that day. They are expected to return to those positions in the sky in 2017, at which point their culpability can be tested. Understandably, there are doubts. Some scientists argue that hydrogen from comets couldn't possibly produce a signal as strong as the wow. But then we can only wait, see, and hope Paris gets the funding he's asking for. Since I began this project roughly six months ago, two new planets have been added to the ever-growing list of possible second Earths. Wolf 1061c, a planet roughly four times Earth's mass, orbiting a red dwarf 13 light-years away, which receives about 60% the sunlight Earth does, and Kepler-1229b, which orbits a red dwarf 769 light-years away and is about 40% larger than Earth, receiving about a third its sunlight. And the data keep coming. Just 10 days ago, NASA announced the confirmation of nearly 1,300 new exoplanets in the Kepler catalog, with nine potentially habitable. Finally, there is the most curious most perplexing, and yet most beguiling story to emerge from the Kepler data to date, the saga of Tabby's star. KIC 8462852 is an unassuming star slightly brighter than our sun, located roughly 1,500 light-years away in the constellation Cygnus. As you might have guessed from its not-particularly-euphonious name, the star was of little interest to humanity 
until it was uncovered in the Kepler catalog. In recognition of the star's sudden rise in interest, its discoverers have taken to calling it Tabby's Star, in honor of their project leader, Tabitha Boyajian. In September 2015, the team reported that, rather than a nice, short, periodic dimming, as would be expected from a transiting planet, Tabby's Star dimmed repeatedly, erratically, and irregularly, by as much as 20%, as if it were orbited by a string of broken pearls. In their paper describing the star's behavior, they concluded that the most likely explanation was that that was orbited by a swarm of giant comets. And then, a month later, astronomer Jason Wright of Gap fame triggered a media explosion when he claimed that the objects just might be an alien megastructure such as a Dyson swarm, though he was quick to say that the comet idea was the more likely. A hastily arranged SETI search found no signals, and other astronomers noted that the, quote, structure was not radiating in the infrared, as such structures were predicted to do. So it seemed the party poopers were right again. E.T. was as elusive as ever. And then, something odd happened. In January 2016, Bradley Schaefer of Louisiana State University, one of the few remaining practitioners of the dying art of reading astronomical photographic plates, looked back at the star through a century of data and found that the star had been dimming for over a century. He calculated that for comets to produce effects on that scale, they would have to be in a swarm 650,000 strong and each 200 kilometers across. While he had ruled out comets, Schaefer refused to countenance alien megastructures, saying that aliens couldn't construct such a thing in less than a century. However, a controlled study using digitized astronomical records at Harvard has shown that this dimming is visible in many stars over the same period suggesting it is more to do with changes in instrumentation than mysterious obstructing objects. Tabitha Boyajian herself considers neither comets nor alien megastructures to be the likely cause of her star's odd behavior, and has launched a Kickstarter campaign to find out what is happening. Whether or not she reaches her $100,000 goal, she has set imaginations on fire. Thousands of amateur astronomers have turned their eyepieces to Tabby's star in the past few months, hoping to write themselves into the stellar mystery. In all likelihood, we will someday learn that the broken ring around Tabby's star is an entirely natural phenomenon. But it is a reminder that, as we stumble toward the final resolution of Fermi's paradox, we should keep Clark's first law in the backs of our minds, and, should it ever prove necessary, always be ready to confront the supposedly impossible. <laughs>